<laughs> All right, everybody, th apologies for the late start, but uh, Mitch has got a short presentation, so um, hopefully we'll be able to catch up with the time. The way this works, as soon as I find my timer on my cell phone, every speaker has five minutes from the point where I say, um, basically from the point that the next speaker ends. All of the slides are preloaded on my machine. If you have a live demo, the time it takes for you to set up your laptop actually takes away from your time. So the best part about lightning talks is if you don't like the one that's on right now, um, well, there'll be another one in five minutes. Um, there's also audience participation. Everybody is actually scheduled for four minutes. And what each speaker has to do is for that extra minute, if they need it, I will ask, call for time. And if you like what the speaker's doing, give a quick, quick round of applause, say yay, woo, woo, and they'll get an extra minute. But if they don't get that, I will start counting down from 10. And I'm going to go like this, Nine, eight, seven, six, five. And when I hit five, that's your job to go. No, 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 go. F <laughs> you, you can do that if the talk sucks. That's perfectly allowed. But count down in the audience, go five. Okay, hopefully you'll, you'll get into it a little bit more, but the audience is actually the buzzer um, when time goes. So we've got a bunch of really great talks slated for today. Um, so without any further ado, let's get this kicked off. Give a huge round of applause for Mitch and Jimmy talking about the hardware hacking area. Time starts now. Great. So this is going to be a fantastic lightning talk session. Um, so I'm Mitch Altman, this is Jimmy Rogers, and uh, we go all over the world setting up hardware hacking areas, teaching people how to solder and make cool things with electronics. Uh, we also set up areas like this every year at Congress at camp so that it's a community resource. Anyone who wants to come and make something, fix something, create something, work with others, learn something, they can come here. And it's not just electronics, it's anything you can make. Yeah, and the uh, hardware hacking area, if you've not been there, is one of the most active areas I've seen. Just even at 4 o'clock in the morning, people are taking things apart and soldering and doing all kinds of crazy hey, stuff. Next so. slide, Link. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we have a ton of workshops. Yep. Shoot, uh, sorry. Um, there we go. Pictures. <laughs> so people actually have a lot of fun. It creates a, a temporary community, and it's all ages. Anyone can learn to do this stuff. It's very useful, and it's a lot of fun. Look at the smiles on these happy people <laughs> soldering away. Uh, and even you know, kids like four years old, uh, it's no problem to learn this stuff. Uh, another slide. Um, there's lots of cool kits that we brought uh, to teach people who uh, have never soldered or made anything or even sewn a button in their life to complete successfully. These are just some projects. There's another slide with more projects. We've got games, we've got blinking lights, we've got noise makers, we've got Arduinos, we've got uh, chargers, we've got all sorts of cool things. And uh, we also have a lot of workshops planned. This is one I'm going to do today at 2 o'clock. For people who don't know Arduino, it's a, a computer chip platform that is designed for non-geeks to be able to use and learn within an hour and a half. So in a three-hour workshop, we're going to go through all of this. Learn to solder, learn to use Arduino, uh, learn to everything you need to know about electronics. Uh, and we'll use a um, uh, TV Be Gone as an example because TV Be Gone is so simple and it's so useful to turn off TVs everywhere you go in public. <clears throat> <laughs> Uh, uh, my co-author for the book I'm writing on how to make uh, cool things with uh, microcontrollers for people who know nothing uh, made this Geiger counter kit and he'll be doing a workshop on that uh, three times today, tomorrow, the next day. Next, Nick. Jimmy. Uh, I'll be doing a circuit bending workshop sometime tomorrow. Um, the time will be on the wiki. Um, basically modifying toys and other electronic instruments, effects pedals, et cetera, et cetera, to make them do other crazy things and additional sounds and make a noise. Stuff. Yeah, pretty much. So um, everyone's invited. You can all come and learn to make cool things. Uh, I also didn't have a slide here, but we also have a brain computer interface workshop happening. Uh, we have a, a, a hacked knitting machine, which will be printing out all sorts of cool things, including mate cozies. Yeah, the rocket badge folks are down there. So whenever you want to talk to them about some of the more advanced stuff, like getting the uh, 
GCC installed on your computer, et cetera, stuff like that. It's, it's all down there and tons of stuff. Yeah, and this is a picture from Noisebridge the last time I did the uh, Arduino for Total Newbies workshop. Oh, and uh, we're also going to have some of those little rocket launchers. They're going to be moved down into the hardware hacking area. So there's a, like 140 USB rocket launchers that are busted. Everybody donated. <laughs> yeah, I think Geek donated here for people to hack on. So uh, we'll have those down there as well so people can come by and grab one. Yeah, so come down and play. And uh, next slide is our contact info. You can contact me or Jimmy anytime for any reason, uh, including if you want to be talked into quitting your job so you can do something more useful. One minute. <laughs> You guys are done? Okay. And uh, by the way, it's uh, 20 euro cents for a Nick Farr head rub. Oh. <laughs> Pay me. <laughs> um, actually, Mitch, I did forget to mention one critical thing. Could I get you to come up and demonstrate something? What you're supposed to do, and yeah, the next speaker should be getting ready. Uh, we've got the general introduction and status update on the development of the Freedom Box, so take the podium, please. Um, one thing, one critical thing I forgot to mention, since I don't know the timing of your slides, is to say slide with emphasis when I'm supposed to switch slides. So Mitch, demonstrate saying slide with emphasis. Slide. <laughs> Little bit faster. Slide. Little bit less enthusiastic. Okay, a little bit faster, but without as much emphasis as the last time. A little bit louder. Okay, you've only got two more slides left, so let, let's make this one count. All right, thank you, Mitch. Alrighty. Also, my screw-ups do not take away from your time, so no need to worry about that. All right, uh, I, I will get better at this eventually. So without any further ado, are you ready to go? Yep. All right, time starts now. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, I'd like to introduce you to the idea of the, the Freedom Box. I don't know if anybody's heard of the Freedom Box, but uh, it's a social networking solution, actually. If you recall how in the days of email, we had uh, Internet Relay Chat and Listserv, there were always multiple providers. And later on with uh, instant messaging and ICQ, there was more lock-in down to fewer providers. And now today, what do we have left? We have uh, one provider, Facebook, and another provider, Google. We have a serious situation of uh, olig olig oligopolistic power. And the solution that we proposed from the Freedom Box Foundation, uh, I should say James Vassil, uh, to whom these uh, ideas are to be attributed, uh, the solution would be distributed social networking instead of everybody being on one social network. The general idea is to have user data on user hardware. Uh, in 2009, then, such hardware became popular. They're called plug computers. They, they use very, very, very little current, so a large number of users could have them on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and have all their data on the user hardware. Uh, the operating system would be a Debian, and there's, uh, at Debian.org, the best source of information is a mailing list, to which you can also see the archives if you don't want to subscribe right away on Debian.org, the mailing list for the, the, the Freedom Box. It's, it's all actually a response of the Debian community and others, there are hundreds on the mailing list, to a challenge pronounced by a professor of law named Eben Moglen. He's famous for actually his work on pretty good privacy but now he's taken up the idea of uh, equipping a plug computer with, uh, with, with Debian software to pre present a social networking challenge. It would be, be also based on PGP and a web of trust. Um, there are questions now. Basically, it would be uh, Jabber and XMPP. Uh, there's, a, there are, there's work going on to see if, if, if Jabber couldn't be developed 
for, the, for, the, for the web to serve beyond uh, instant messaging. Monkey Sphere is a question. Buddy Cloud, which uh, had a big uh, event at the uh, CCC event last summer, is, is also in the, in, in the running, as is uh, Privoxy. Uh, my own particular experience has been with PageKite, which is a service run from Iceland, which makes it easy to break into, uh, break through a router or break through a firewall. Where Two minutes. Subscribers might not be expected to be offering content. Internet service providers think of their subscribers as people who are supposed to consume, not produce. And PageKite makes it easy to break through, break through that barrier. Um, I have a couple of uh, dream plugs with me, which is the hardware anticipated to be used. Uh, and at the, the smaller workshop, we'll do a demonstration this afternoon of how uh, the dream plug can be, can, can be set up uh, using PageKite to get through and uh, show what, what is now possible. The big, the big remaining issues are uh, certificates, how one Freedom Box can uh, identify it to other Freedom Boxes, and of course the big issue of the user interface, because the idea is to make this so easy to use for the average consumer. One minute, extend time. <laughs> yeah. I, I, okay. The web interface. Establishing the web interface is the big challenge. The Freedom Box Foundation won some money from Kickstarter, uh, but now we may have to be paying people to develop the web interface. It's such a huge challenge. Um, so I'd be glad to take any questions to know what you're really interested in, if in the, in the, the little time I have. 30 seconds. Yeah? Page Kite. P-A-G-E. K I T E. It's like a kite seconds. that shows where your page is located. How much? How much does it cost? The dream plug costs $130, and uh, J JTAG is maybe another 10, and uh, uh, FedEx from Hi. California Four. is $30. <laughs> 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 All right, good, good, good job with that. It's always hard being one of the first people to present um, in the lightning talks. And so next we have how to enter a Linux PC with a manipulated USB device. Ready to go? Oh wow, he's, he's on. Big round of applause for just being like, bam, right there. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I'm okay. Max Engelsberger from uh, Pforzheim University, and I'm very glad to be here today speaking uh, in front of uh, this uh, wonderful audience. My uh, topic is about how to enter Linux PC with a manipulated USB device. Slide, please, Nick. <laughs> oh, and, and just, just a quick, quick note. When I screw up like that, the speaker automatically gets another 15 seconds, so we'll, uh, we'll reset his clock. <laughs> Uh, this, is, this project is about a security vulnerability which was first discovered by uh, Rafael Dominguez Vega from the MRW Info Security Lab uh, in UK. And this was first discovered in May 2011. So um, shortly after this, uh, the vulnerability was closed. So this is definitely not a zero day slide, please. On uh, Linux, you have uh, two ways to uh, execute uh, software. You can do this in user space or you can do this in kernel space. If you execute uh, programs in kernel space, you should really know what you do because you can access any uh, memory location you want. Slide, please. My uh, target system is a PC running Linux with an unpatched kernel version 2.6.32. And uh, the system has to be configured for dynamic uh, loading of the kernel modules related to the Kayak USB audio interface. Slide, please. Here you can see the init module and the init uh, function of the driver module, which shows in the highlighted line how the product name, which came from the USB device, and is be copied to um, the uh, sound subsystem. As you can see, this is performed without a length check, so uh, the memory which was allocated here is just 80 bytes, 
and if you copy more than or transmit more than uh, 80 bytes from the device, this is no problem here. Slide, please. Here you can see a small hardware setup I have done uh, based on an 8-bit microcontroller, and its uh, GPIOs are directly connected to the USB. Slide, please. I'm using on the microcontroller a uh, virtual USB uh, stack from Objective Developments in, in Austria. And uh, I have here the possibility to freely configure all the parameters uh, like product ID, vendor ID, and uh, of course my device name. Slide, please. So I plug in the device, and the USB subsystem recognizes, hey, there's a new device, loads the um, product, uh, uh, loads uh, the kernel module related to the product ID, and reads the very long device name. In order to this, the kernel freezes and um, system stops. Slide, please. My constraints are you have to have physical access to the system, and uh, you need unpatched kernel version. Slide, please. So my conclusions are don't use band function calls. Um, code review is always a good idea. And uh, further work for this project could maybe um, be automated pen tests or educational purposes or scientific research. Slide, please. If you want to uh, ask me a question or um, contribute to the system or just give feedback be to me, please uh, send me an email. Thank you very much. Nice. All right, GNUnet for network neutrality. You ready to go? <coughs> so, uh, hello. Um, actually, uh, re real quickly, um, I just so that I make sure uh, this is is this the updated deck that you sent yeah. me? Okay, Perfect. so you're good. Okay, all right. And time starts now. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. My name is Matthias Wax, and I'm a member of the GNUnet project. I'm mainly working on the transport um, component of our peer-to-peer -peer framework. And since we released our new version um, some weeks ago, uh, I want to tell you about the latest developments and our vision about uh, how we want to enforce network neutrality and censorship resistance with our framework. Slide, please. So, uh, basically, GNUnet um, is free software and um, is an extensible peer-to-peer -peer framework which um, you can use to easily develop you, um, your vision of a new peer-to-peer -peer application. Um, our idea we want to give you with um, GNUnet is connectivity everywhere without um, the possibility to limit your traffic or um, to censor your traffic. So. Um, if you want to uh, exchange your information with your body, you should uh, be able to do it um, anytime, anywhere, and with uh, whoever you want. Um, so, um, what, does, um, what does GNUnet do to um, realize this vision? So, basically, uh, GNUnet has more than one transport protocol we can provide you. So, if you have an internet service provider, which um, improves your internet connectivity with techniques like quality of service or traffic shaping. You can just switch to a different transport plugin that uh, is perfectly, um, perhaps giving you a better performance. So we provide you with a, a TCP, a UDP, HTTP, and HTTPS. So um, if your connectivity is somehow limited, you can just switch the plugin. If you have one of these providers who protects you in your private network and uses techniques like network, a network address translation, a proxy, or um, a filter, that's also no problem with GNUnet because with GNUnet you have techniques like um, UPnP various net reversal techniques, and we have also um, a client-only mode where you, you only use outbound connections. Um, IPv6 is now, how old, I don't know, at least 10 years, but we have many of these um, internet service providers uh, who still do not support IPv6. So um, if you have to access one of these fancy websites um, with IPv6 only hosting your latest government secrets, um, you should perhaps have a look at the GNUnet VPN application. Uh, the GNUnet VPN application um, is giving you um, address tunneling and um, no protocol tunneling and protocol translation. So you get bo uh, both um, uh, four over six and six over four and four to six and six to four address translation in a peer-to-peer -peer 
based approach, so you don't two need, minutes. Uh, so you don't need an external tunnel broker. Um, okay, so your ISP is old, old school. Okay, but what if you don't have any ISP? Um, so with Moonet we support um, mesh networks. So we have an um, uh, WLAN physical layer transport plugin. Um, so uh, if you have a little um, hacking session near the campfire, it's no problem. You and your buddies can connect on Wi-Fi physical layer directly. And if you use our mesh service, um, if one of your buddies still has internet access, we can route uh, with the mesh service to the internet. So I'm currently working on um, a new mathematical approach to select always the best transport mechanism for you and to automatically assign the correct amount of bandwidth to, uh, to all the peers you communi uh, communicate with. And uh, for this, I'm trying to find a mathematical approach. One minute, extend time. Next. Next uh, so, thank you very much. It was really a huge audience. Um, so, you can more, uh, find more information on our website. So, uh, visit, uh, visit GNU.org or uh, just join us. Uh, so, me and our group uh, on um, Freenode uh, in the channel GNUnet, or just grab a uh, beer with me today in the evening after the talk. And our latest um, version is um, out now. So. Visit our website, download it, and give it a try. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, webmail with end-to-end -end PGP encryption. Okay. Um, visit to Brazil, hacker culture. Okay. All right, Jens. And so I'm going to start your time from, yeah, uh, actually, take it at the podium. So I'll start your time pretty much when you get set up on the podium. And time starts because when you have to use setup, that takes away from your time. So as to be fair to everybody else who submitted slides in advance. So time starts now. I'm working on it. So, um, my name is Jens, but it doesn't matter here. Um, earlier that month, I was in Brazil to, because there was an event called Cultura Digital.br, and I wanted to see the Brazilian hackerspaces. So, this is one of the bus which was crowdfunded, not by Kickstarter, but um, another Brazilian crowdfunding platform. And that drove the hackers from uh, Sao Paulo to Rio de Janeiro to go to that kind of event, which was happening at the Museum of Modern Art in uh, Rio. Uh, which, happening, oh, which happening in the Museum of Modern Art in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, this is an area which called the Arena, and there was like uh, political people coming to that event, and then you got the discussion to debate with these people about open data, transparency, all these kinds of things. This is one of the reasons why I was also there. Um, you can see there's a difference between culture in here and culture in there. Maybe they're being the same-minded people when it comes to hackerspaces, but uh, Brazil have much more have a culture inside of their society. You can see that already with the Zamba thing, but it's also going into digital culture. Uh, this was the, like the audience. The guy you see from the second from the left is like the former culture minister from Brazil. He was very, very famous there. Uh, he got really, really good debates on the stage. Uh, I skip that. Uh, this is the Museum of Modern Art and it's really, really a nice event because they now are starting to get the idea building up hackerspaces. Rio de Janeiro not have yet a hackerspace, while I can say they just founding another one. Uh, this is one of the robots I've seen there, which is very impressive, and it tries to get the clash with the technology and the culture change in there and the actual society. Uh, this is like the only the entrance, so it was completely for free for the conference. Uh, it looks like that. They're recording all the talks and streaming them. And this is like the post that everyone can contribute. Hey, we're doing that event. How do you want to make our event looks like? So everyone was able to contribute the poster and they published all of these. Uh, this is like you can put little paper things and it's flying in the air. It's very nice for kids. 
uh, they have a maker board, and so everyone was like showing what's happening in their town. Brazil is really, really huge, so people had to travel a lot in there. Uh, that was on stage, and of course there was like street music outside playing music. What you can see here, it's like 50 people playing music and 200 people around it. So it's a completely different feeling to stand there. The evening concert. So I was taking that bus, which was crowdfunded for hackers, back to Sao Paulo to spend some days in Sao Paulo. And there's a hacker space in uh, Sao Paulo, which is in the Castle de Cultura, which is that place, which is a former place which was used in a movie, but now they use it in the basement to have a space. Uh, it's called the Garua Hackerspace. It's raining there a lot, like in Hamburg, like in my town. So they have the umbrella as a sign. Um, this is the reason why this space started, because it was like one guy in the university wanted to build his own flipper. Uh, the university basically told him, hey, the university is not a good place to do so. So he started a Hackerspace a year ago. And now it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger because they got our idea, they had been on the camp, and they really like that. So what I want to say is there's more hackerspaces between US and Europe. You have to watch over the borders to also other countries. When you go to uh, look at hackerspaces.org, check out if there is a space, uh, announce yourself in the IRC, and you will figure that out. These people was really, really hostile to me. They showed me a lot of things. We partied a lot. Um, One minute call for extension. Like uh, the day I had to drive back, they ordered me a special taxi called Ja Taxi, uh, which has like you can see on the internet, which is his actual position. He has a New York telephone number, so when you're being in New York, you can call him to catch you up from the airport. He has an iPad in the car and Wi-Fi for free. That's basically it. Thank you very much. And, and give Yen an extra special round of applause for actually being adventurous and running slides off his own laptop. Those are great pictures. Okay, Confine, you're up next. And just let me make sure that I got your latest deck. Nope, oh, that's not it. That's definitely not it. That's it. Okay. So, hi, my name is Aaron Kaplan. I'm uh, one of the founders of the Funkfeuer network in, in Austria. That's uh, roughly equivalent to the Freifunk networks in Germany. Uh, it's a wireless community mesh network uh, covering multiple cities in, in Austria and covering also all of Vienna, essentially, and almost extending to Bratislava, which is the next largest uh, capital quite close to Vienna. So, um, I'm involved with the Confi Confined project. Uh, next slide, please. That's a um, project, uh, EU project uh, consisting of multiple partners, uh, multiple community wireless networks. The Athens wireless network is part of that. That's covering all of Athens, roughly 5,000 mesh nodes. Um, wireless GIFINET in Barcelona, roughly 14,000 nodes, maybe by now 15,000. They're growing exponentially at the moment. Funkfeuer US, uh, some research institutes and universities, the Fraunhofer Institute, uh, the University Polytechnic of Catalonia in Barcelona and uh, um, a few other organizations. So uh, what we're doing in the Confine project, next slide please, is that we're building um, sort of a planet lab for mesh networks. Um, quick show of hands, who's familiar with planet lab? Okay, just a few. Okay, planet lab is essentially a distributed confederated um, test bed network for uh, mainly researchers uh, trying out new protocols like let's say peer-to-peer -peer protocols or um, uh, something like BitTorrent or whatever. Yeah? So uh, usually a university will contribute one or two servers to the project and uh, it's quite a large confederated test network where each server has multiple slices so it's a virtualized network, virtualized uh, uh, VMs on, the, uh, on, the, on each server and um, there were really many very interesting results from Planet Lab. Now the whole thing is very different if you go to wireless, uh, the wireless layer, because 
wireless is um, it doesn't have these nice properties like the cable essentially you have uh, interference <laughs> you have lots of noise you have lots of crappy stuff that that really makes it totally different. So that's, that's one lesson that all the, the community networks learned, the hardware. Every community wireless network that built a network and not, was just not theorizing about it, actually learned that layer one is the stuff that really sucks. Um, so we also have these wireless battle uh, mesh uh, events regularly. Maybe you have heard about them. Uh, that's where the community wireless networks folks meet in Europe every year. The next one is going to be in Greece. And you can think of, um, plan, uh, uh, of Confine as sort of a permanent wireless battle mesh network, um, network um, you know, and uh, with, on different layers. So uh, layer one would be a virtualized network in a virtual machi machine. Let's say 1,000 uh, OpenWRT instances running in parallel in a virtual network in a server. You can test code there. Second thing would be um, to have actual hardware connected with coax cables, attenuators, and you can uh, work on Wi-Fi drivers there without having interference. Um, third level would be the actual test network. And for Funkfeuer, we're going to build that in the Alps, so we're going to exercise a bit. Will be very good for my tummy. And um, yeah, so. Essentially what we're having is the community wireless networks and the R&D institutes, the universities are finally working together there. And it's not like the, the universities are just publishing about uh, wireless, wireless mesh stuff and they get it all wrong because they didn't have a real network. That was their problem. They always si simulated it in NS2. And the community wireless networks didn't have the scientific backing. So Extend I think, time. Oh, thanks. So I think... Uh, that's uh, essentially what's going to happen over the next four years. Next slide, please. And we need your input. So in case in, you're in that field, or in case you're into wireless community networks, mesh networks, R&D, you want to go in that direction, please contact us. Um, here you find my email address. Uh, the confineproject.eu website has some uh, background information. And that's about it. Thanks. Myself here. Okay. And Netzob? Okay, ready to go? Yes. All right. So, hi, everybody. I'm going to talk about an open source project called Netzob. Um, just speak a little louder and into more yeah. into the microphone. You can, you can actually bring it towards you. So NetZob is a framework dedicated to help you in the process of reverse engineering of communication protocols. Next slide, please. So by communication protocols, I mean every I interaction. A little bit too close. I mean <laughs> every interaction you can find between uh, entities, whether this entity is a binary, a library, a process, a kernel module, a device, or even a remote entity. Next slide. So there are different needs to do reverse engineering. So as, as I come from a security company, my main uh, reason to do that is to assess the robustness of um, proprietary implementation of protocols. But you, you may also want to simulate uh, traffic in order to test third-party products like IDS or firewalls. Um, previous slide, please. You may want to analyze uh, traffic for potential information leakage, and you also may want to develop an open source version of a proper protocol implementation. Slide, please. So this is a big picture of NetZub. It's uh, in five parts. The, the first part is um, uh, to do data acquisition. So there are captors and sensors to retrieve data from network or API calls, for example. The heart of NetZub is based on grammar and vocabulary in France. And as output, you have uh, the simulation module. You can generate traffic, uh, both client and server. Uh, you have the fuzzing part. So you, you use the simulation part to, uh, and to do variation on um, data. And you can export uh, protocol inferred uh, to do, um, in the, dissect, um, the dissector of Wireshark or SCAPI, for example. Slide, please. 
So one, one word on uh, the vo vocabulary inference. So the goal is to retrieve the message format of a uh, protocol, of each message. And um, it's based on two uh, main, two well-known algorithms in the DNA field. Um, so we have implemented those protocols. Uh, the, the other steps is, um, that uh, NetZop provides is a field uh, type identification, the semantic identification. And w one thing which is pretty cool is that, is, is that Net NetZop is able to retrieve the file length field and its associated payload. So you can, for example, retrieve the um, TCP uh, payload but, um, above the IP payload, for example. Slide, please. One word on the grammar inference. So the, the goal is to retrieve the state machine of the protocol. Uh, it's based on two well-known algorithms also. Uh, it's an active process, so you use, um, use um, an implementation of the protocol so that you can stimulate, um, and you can retrieve the state and transition between states. Slide, please. So this is a, a screenshot of the interface um, of NetZub. Slide, please. So it's licensed under the GPLv3 license. Uh, it's developed notably as part of a thesis, and it's sponsored by Amosis and Superlec, which are a French company and uh, engineer school. So this is, this is our website, netzop.org, and we will release a um, Debian package in the next days. So I hope you will enjoy it. Thanks. All right, and with one minute and 42 seconds left, that's, that's a record for today. Do we have harvesting boarding passes? Harvesting boarding passes, okay. Web FWD. Web FWD. Okay, so OPSEC top 10, Ultra Mega Man, are you here? Okay, awesome, sweet. That one disappeared. Does this work? Can you hear me? Closer. Is this good? Yeah, good. Okay, thanks. And yeah, this was scheduled for 13, 20, no. 35? 1335, yeah. So give him a round of applause for actually doing what I told him to do and showing up 15 minutes early. Because that's the funny thing about lightning talks is that you never know. You, I mean, I think last year we had five people in a row skip out on their presentations after they confirmed over email. And while I'm taking this break, you can submit a lightning talk. We have many, many slots open for um, tomorrow for the Pecha Kucha round, and we still have some slots open for day four. If you specifically requested day four um, and sent me an email about it, I. I skipped over your email. I probably didn't have a chance to reply to it, but I will include you on day four if you've, um, if you've emailed me already. Uh, the instructions for submitting a lightning talk are on the wiki. Um, if you just go to events.ccc.de slash congress slash 2011 slash wiki slash lightning underscore talks, you will be able to find the page where you can, um, where you have the tiny little form. Send in your slides. Keep your abstract short, and uh, if you want to participate in the Pecha Kucha round, you get an extra whole one and two thirds minutes. Um, and it's also really fun. It's a format that's taking off that the Congress decided they wanted to do this year, and I thought, hey, why don't we try it? But without any further ado, um, Ultra Mega Man, you ready to go? Yeah. Awesome. Let's get this started. Time starts now. Hi, uh, I'm Paul. I'm from Canada. I'm a security consultant. Uh, my interests include cryptography, civil liberties, remote code execution, and scotch. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about OPSEC uh, as my top 10 list of things everyone should do. It should be quick and funny. Um, my motivation for this talk is that in Canada there's a bill in our parliament to uh, allow the police to warrantlessly wiretap our cell phones and internet connections. Uh, I believe everyone should be prepared for this by knowing how to protect their data. Slide. Number 10, end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, we live in a surveillance society. This tech should be everyone's first countermeasure. Slide. Number nine, full disk encryption. If your gadget gets stolen or seized, make sure they can't read your data. Number eight, oh, slide, yeah. Uh, number eight, wipe your device. Uh, even better than having your encrypted data stolen, not having your data stolen. Uh, Jake and Moxie aren't the only ones, uh, but they're probably the best documented cases. 
slide. Number seven, don't log chat. If your stuff gets seized and the feds get your logs, your friends are going to be pissed. <laughs> slide. Number six, stop snitching. If you're an informant for the government or military turning in your friends, I hope your body shows up in a landfill. <laughs> Next slide. Use Tor. Uh, the strong legal support behind uh, running a Tor exit means that if suspicious traffic leads your IP, eh, it was Tor. Next slide. Uh, don't host in America. Uh, I'm pretty sure I don't have to tell a room full of Europeans about this. Uh, <laughs> slide. Uh, <laughs> number three, don't use closed source. Uh, between the intentional backdoors and the accidental bugs, uh, I don't think you can trust it. Slide. Uh, number two, prevent evil mate attacks. Uh, BIOS rootkits exist, they're hard to detect, and the government pays five to six figures for them. Do the math. And the number one thing that you should, everyone should do is don't fuck Swedish women. <laughs> oh. This slide. There's more? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, just, just next slide. Um, uh, because I have a bit of time, uh, I'd like to mention my favorite political prisoner. Uh, Byron Son was arrested uh, before the G20 in Toronto in 2010. Uh, he's the only person still left in the legal system. Um, he's being punished by the state for embarrassing the police and the security apparatus. Uh, his trial is a grim precedent for all of us that would poke at holes in the security system, and it's important that we all stand with him. Thanks. Did, did you realize that you had two minutes and 11 seconds left? Yeah, I know. That was, that was, wow. <laughs> Second round of applause for that. Okay, yeah. I am not, I'm not prepared for this talk very good because I just read that I, I am set for now. Yeah. I was at home, but I did not know about it. You know, it came oh, okay. very late. Oh, we, we can postpone, it's okay. Ah, yeah. Oh, we can postpone. Very good. Just, just send me an email, we'll postpone. It's okay. All right. Okay. Hello? Send you an email or what should I do? Yeah, send me an email. Yeah? Yeah. And so just say. Tomorrow or after yeah. tomorrow? Mm -hmm. like yeah. last day. day four. Yep. That's yeah, fine. Okay. Yeah, just send me an email. No problem. Okay. All right. Uh, Trojans? Hello? Hello? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, did, you, did you send me slides or no? Yes, I sent okay, right. you. That, that, that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll handle it. That's cool. Okay. Um, this is the one for 1340? Okay, yeah. All right, and since we're a little bit ahead of time, how, about, how do you guys feel about a quick stretch break? Quick stretch break? Get up, yep. Get up, get up. early in the morning. Let's get all those bottles to fall right now <laughs> so that it doesn't happen during the talk. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah, because light, lightning talks are intense, you know, that, that's a lot of information, not a lot of time. You gotta, gotta stretch it out a little bit. Also, we are going to be switching languages. So the next two talks are in German. So I should probably figure out what... Yeah, I don't know how to feel about that. Um, so, yeah, and this would also give it time. You know, the only two talks in German, um, there will be no live translation, because that would be... Probably next year. I, actually, the people who are doing live translation of the German events this year are doing a really great job, and I think they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> but in the meantime, I should probably figure out what the German word for slide is. Huh? No, it's just slide. Just, oh, oh you're, you're just going to do, just, just, just going to say slide? I don't. What, 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 I'm curious now, though. What is the German word? I'm trying to learn German here. Uh, Mr. Folia. Fulia? Did I get that kind of right? 
Fulia? Okay. Fulia. Fall. Fall. Okay, I think we'll just stick with slide. How about that? <laughs> okay. You ready to go? Yeah. Okay, audience, are you guys ready to go? <laughs> All right, time starts now. Okay, hello, my name is Jens Stromberg. Und als ich äh, dieses Jahr gesehen habe, was unsere Regierung mit dem Staatstrojaner macht, hat mich das sehr wütend gemacht. Und ich habe dann angefangen, mich damit zu beschäftigen, was kann man eigentlich dagegen tun? Und habe mich damit beschäftigt, auf welcher Grundlage eigentlich solche Maßnahmen überhaupt angewendet werden. Slide, please. Ähm, der Punkt ist halt, ähm, es gibt halt verschiedene Gesetze, die das halt genau regeln, wie zum Beispiel hier am Beispiel Telekommunikationsüberwachung, wie solche Maßnahmen eigentlich genehmigt werden und wie die konkreten administrativen Abläufe in der Behörde sind. Und ähm, man kann daran relativ viel Kritik üben. Ich will das hier ganz kurz aufgreifen. Ähm, man sieht hier links einen ersten Regelkreis, wo in dem Sinne praktisch eine Maßnahme angeregt wird und wo es eigentlich einen Richtervorbehalt gibt. In der Praxis wird dieser Richtervorbehalt heute so nicht effektiv gelebt. Das heißt, ein großer Teil der Maßnahmen wird halt ohne die richtig zu prüfen einfach genehmigt. Ähm, das ist das erste große Problem. Dann, wenn so eine Maßnahme genehmigt ist, wird sie halt durchgeführt. Das haben wir ja gesehen beim Staatstrojaner, dass das da beispielsweise relativ schlecht technisch umgesetzt ist, dann gibt es ein anderes großes Problem. Grundsätzlich gilt halt, alle Betroffenen einer TKÜ-Maßnahme sind zum Beispiel auch im Nachhinein zu benachrichtigen. Das ist deswegen wichtig, damit diese Betroffenen, das heißt wir als Bürger, wenn wir darüber informiert werden, dass wir abgehört worden sind, wenn wir das nicht für richtig halten, entsprechend auch politisch aktiv werden können, um uns gegen sowas zu wehren. Heute ist es aber de facto so, dass in zwei Dritteln aller überwachten Anschlüsse überhaupt gar keine Benachrichtigung von Betroffenen stattfindet. Und in Ermangelung dieser Benachrichtigung können wir uns dann auch nicht dagegen wehren. Äh, aus diesem Grund bin ich der Meinung, slide please, dass man bereits im Grundgesetz praktisch äh, diesen Überwachungsmaßnahmen jeden Boden entziehen muss. Im Grundgesetz ist die Privatsphäre, darunter verstehe ich jetzt, oder das Grundgesetz eben, dass Telefone nicht abgehört werden, dass es in dem Sinne keine Wohnungsüberwachung gibt, dass auch die Post nicht überwacht wird, dass in dem Sinne auch der PC nicht überwacht wird. Diese Dinge sind im Grundgesetz bereits festgeschrieben. In den letzten Jahren sind dann immer wieder Änderungen am Grundgesetz durchgeführt worden, um halt diese Überwachungsmaßnahmen überhaupt erst zu ermöglichen. Ähm, ich habe in der Piratenpartei eine Initiative gestartet, diese entsprechenden Absätze im Grundgesetz, die das ermöglichen, ersatzlos zu streichen. Slide, please. Ähm, letzte Folie. Hier sehen wir jetzt in dem Sinn den Link. Ähm, alle Piraten möchte ich dazu auffordern, sich mit dem auseinanderzusetzen und diese Initiative zu unterstützen. Und ansonsten alle anderen, die an dem Thema interessiert sind, freue ich mich immer gerne auf entsprechendes Feedback oder Anregungen. Danke. Um, and you have two minutes left. Do we have a second microphone for questions? Okay. Do you, would you like to take questions real quick with your last two minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Maybe you should repeat that in German in case they didn't get it the first time. Genau, wenn noch jemand Fragen hat. Okay, give them a round of applause. All right, do we have the Pirate Party talk? And did you guys submit slides or do you have... Oh, background picture. Background picture? Like okay, did I? <coughs> okay. Security X, Security X. <laughs> Willst du das Mikro nehmen? War das überhaupt basisdemokratisch? Kommen Sie mir nicht so. Wow. I has the Internet. Ja, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebes Präsidium. Um, do we have a second handheld? 
Second what? A, a second handheld microphone, or are you guys that's, okay like this? Okay? Oh yeah, if you're fine with it, that's cool. Uh, we're flexible. Yeah. And since. Gott, ist das kompliziert. Rednerliste. Okay, uh, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebes. Was? Können wir? Um, yeah, if you guys, if you guys are ready to go, everybody's good. Audience is ready. We're all ready. It's time starts. Well, actually, I'm just waiting for 13:40, so we can get exactly back on time. Time starts now. Okay, das Präsidium meint es ganz genau. Ähm, mein Name ist Alexander Morlang. Ich bin Pirat und seit kurzem Mitglied des Abgeordnetenhauses und gehöre zu dem ungefähr Drittel der Fraktion der Piratenpartei, äh, welches äh, CCC-Hintergrund hat. Das ist dann Piratenfraktionär mit CCC-Hintergrund. Äh, der Mensch hier ist Plätzchen. Plätzchen ist unser Chef, also unser Admin. Und äh, wir werden ein bisschen aus dem Maschinenraum der Fraktion erzählen. Plätzchen. Ja, ähm, also mein Name ist Plätzchen, aber... Eigentlich Philipp Brechler. Ich bin irgendwie aus Versehen der Admin der Fraktion geworden. Ich mache den Job jetzt exakt einen Tag nach der Wahl, weil wir dann ja schon was brauchten. Wir haben jetzt eine Webseite, ein LDAP, ein funktionierendes Webmailer-System und Kalender und so. Kriegen jetzt bald unseren eigenen Serverraum im AGH, der total überdimensioniert ist, hint, hint. Und brauchen jetzt eure Hilfe, weil wir haben uns überlegt, hm, ja, so ein Wiki-System ist ja ganz nett, Media-Wiki, aber zum Dokumentieren und Maschinenlesbarkeit der Fraktion herstellen, äh, brauchen wir was anderes und haben uns äh, für ein Redmine-System entschieden, das ja eigentlich aus der Softwareentwicklung kommt, haben das schon ein bisschen angepasst und ähm, suchen jetzt Leute, die uns weiter dabei helfen, es anzupassen. Also jemand, der Ruby programmieren kann. Ähm, und äh, das gleiche gilt auch noch für ein WordPress, da brauchen wir auch noch ein bisschen Hilfe. Das allerdings nicht wirklich viele und das kann wahrscheinlich jemand äh, schnell machen. Ähm, und wir haben tatsächlich auch ein Budget dafür, dass ihr das tut, denn ähm, wir wollen die Open-Source-Entwicklung äh, unterstützen. Und warum wir das tun wollen und wie, äh, das sagt jetzt nochmal Alex. Okay, du wolltest eigentlich über die Technik erzählen, oder? Ja, dass wir einen Band-Backup haben. Also wir machen sogar Backups. Anyway, es gibt äh, diverses Zeug. Wir machen das jetzt mit diesem Redmine. Wir versuchen äh, tatsächlich äh, mit modernen Mitteln eine Fraktion in einem wirklich alten System äh, zu betreiben. Und es sind so ein paar Sachen aufgefallen, die stören, die fehlen. Also wir benutzen Etherpad, um unsere Protokolle zu schreiben, öffentlichen. Wir brauchen endlich mal eine LDAP-Anbindung für Etherpad oder Etherpad Lite. Wir brauchen einen externen Zuschauerserver, weil es nicht angehen kann, dass irgendwie 5000 Leute diesen Server in die Knie dringen und wir dann nicht mehr Protokolle schreiben können, beziehungsweise nicht mehr öffentlich. Ähm, wir hätten gerne eine Ethernet Lite Integration ins Redmine. Ähm, wenn ich ein Wiki habe oder ein Pad und das getrennt ist, ist es voll doof. Ich würde gerne kollaborativ an den Dingern arbeiten. Wir brauchen ein kollaboratives Mindmapping. Wir haben ein Doodle in dem Redmine. Das ist ganz toll, falls mal jemand ein eigenes Doodle betreiben will. Aber das Ding muss dringend mit dem Kalenderserver abgleichen können und Kaldav sprechen. Wir brauchen eine Dokumentenverwaltung, die über das Ablegen von Dokumenten hinausgeht und nicht für Bürokräfte gemacht wurde, sondern für Nerds gemacht wurde. Wir brauchen ein Ideenbeschluss-Tracking, wo wir in der Lage sind, eine Idee von der Entstehung in einer Arbeitsgruppe, dem ersten Eintrag im Wiki, der Diskussion in der Mailingliste, dem Gang durchs Liquid Feedback, mit dem entsprechenden Antrag für die Fraktion bzw. Fraktionsversammlung, Zuordnung in dem Cluster, Clusterprojekt, Ausschussreferenten bis hin zur Ausschusslesung und dann dem Durchgang durchs Parlament zu tracken, damit du auf einen Blick siehst, wo ist das Ding überall gewesen, wer hat was dazu geschrieben, wer hat sich Gedanken dazu gemacht, so etwas, wenn wir irgendwelche Anträge in anderen Landesverbänden recyceln wollen, dass der, der recyceln will, auch mal sinnvoll tun kann. Wir brauchen ein Anything to Structure Data Connector, weil ganz viele Leute stellen Dinge ins Web, das sind dann irgendwelche PDFs, das sind irgendwelche gruseligen Webseiten, die müssen gescrapt werden, da müssen RSS-Feeds draus entstehen, da muss ICS draus entstehen. Und ganz, ganz wichtig, wir müssen diesen ganzen trockenen Zahlenwust visualisieren, damit man damit irgendwie sinnvoll was anfangen kann. Das ist Abstimmungsverhalten, das sind äh, Vorgänge, das sind Richtungen. Ähm, und wir haben uns gesagt, wir One minute nehmen extend eine, time. Ja, wunderbar. Wir nehmen. Wir, was? Wir haben ein Budget und wir werden diese ganzen Projekte demnächst ausschreiben, um die Open Source Entwicklung auch im Bereich parlamentarische Tools zu stärken. Vielen lieben Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Uh, one more sentence. 
Um, und wir haben einen Mailinglistenserver unter lists.piratenfraktion-berlin.de. Da gibt es eine Liste, die heißt IT. Sinnigerweise, äh, wer mitarbeiten will, könnte sich am besten da mal eben registrieren. Dann können wir kommunizieren. Danke, tschüss. Oh, you, you actually have one, one question and 20 seconds left. Nein, äh, das nicht, aber wir, wir wollen äh, erstmal unsere eigenen Zeug in die richtige Richtung bekommen und dann können wir mit der IT reden des Abgeordnetenhauses, weil die, ähm, sagen wir so, wir kommen sehr gut miteinander aus und äh, die haben auch sehr viele Ideen, aber die brauchen halt auch einen parlamentarischen Arm, weil sie halt selber gar nichts entscheiden dürfen. So, das heißt, wir hätten das gerne für uns und dann könnte man ja gucken, dass wir das auch für den Rest bekommen. Round of applause. Hello? Yeah, it's worked. Okay. okay, social swarm, are you guys ready to go? And did I get did I get new slides from you or are you gonna use a laptop? No, Okay, let me let me see. You, you realize I was on stage a half an hour ago, right? Let's see. That's correct? Yes. Okay, that's the correct deck. All right. Um, and for those of you playing along at home, shockingly, we are actually four minutes ahead of schedule. The social swarm talk is on the schedule for 1350. Um, I'm not going to kill a whole four minutes, but I just also, I do want to say that uh, we do have plenty of slots open for tomorrow for the Pecha Kucha round. Uh, you can even email me as you're watching this talk right now with your 20-slide deck. And of course, day four, there are probably still some slots left. Um, I answer all the emails in the order that I receive them. Uh, day four is a pretty popular talk, so if you want to get one in, I would recommend doing that as quickly as possible. Um, or adjusting your slides to the Pecha Kucha format, which will probably result in brand new levels of lightning talk hilarity. That's, that's what I'm counting on, lots and lots of humor. So are you guys ready to go? Everybody? Okay. Um, and then I believe coming up, uh, coming up at 2 o'clock, we're just going to take a quick 10-minute break. Um, but we've got Tinkerforge, Tinkerforge Bricks, Fat's Latest Hits, Hacking a Train's Intercom, which I actually hope is here. And even if he's not, I'm going to play the video he sent me anyway. Uh, Code Hero, Queer Geeks panel, lots of other stuff. But without any further ado, round of applause. We'll start your time when it ends. Go. Hi, we are Rena Tangens and Lena Simon from Social Swarm. Um, the, we do this talk in English because this is an international project, despite we both speak German usually. Um, well, uh, next slide, please. We all know Facebook is evil because depending on big corporations who give a shit about laws, privacy, or any issues that concern us, and you all know it's central data storage and the corporations have access to it, um, there is the danger of manipulation because Facebook knows it all. And users are not the customers, they are the products being sold. We all know this. Facebook is evil, but most people here even use it anyway. <laughs> Boycott seems futile. Slide, please. The problem is there's one other really important feature about Facebook. It's awesome. Um, it really, it really uh, does a lot of good stuff and people can connect and uh, that's why uh, all the non-nerds uh, use it uh, very much and um, it, it really works in getting people 
wanting to use it. And that's the reason why boycotting it, um, it doesn't really work as, as well because I don't want to live in a world where 80% of the people can be manipulated easily uh, through social networks. So, slide please. Uh, so far, uh, there has been a lot of um, uh, ideas how to solve the problem. There was, uh, for example, the quit Facebook day. We had the suicide machine where you could erase your Facebook profile. Um, there was a huge donations um, when Diaspora uh, la launched the project. Um, and we have plenty of other alternative projects, um, software projects, or uh, uh, things like the Freedom Boxes, um, where, where people put a lot of hard work to uh, getting ideas what, uh, how we can solve the Facebook pro problem. Uh, this year, the, uh, Facebook was awarded with a Big Brother Award and we are having more and more uh, mostly negative uh, headlines about Facebook in the media. Slide. Well, what is the idea of the, the social swarm? Um, we want to go somewhere nicer and we want to do it together. And this means we want to reunite forces. We want to form a think tank with all the other projects. We don't want just to program one new project, um, but we want to connect them. And our, our goals are free software, open standards to connect. We want end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, we want decentral data storage. And we want alternative funding. This means do not trade your data for uh, free access to a platform. Um, we want to create a hype. We want to make it cool to change somewhere else and to work on a new project. And we want to have the cake and eat it too. We want to, be, want to have real privacy and we want to connect. Next slide. So now it's your turn. We, we did uh, our short uh, version of the talk. Uh, it's your turn. Um, you can come to the workshops uh, around the, uh, this Congress. You can join the mailing list uh, and you can visit our website. Um, the, the workshops are, uh, there's one, to, uh, they are both today. Um, one is at a quarter to four, uh, downstairs in the basement in the huge workshop room A3. And the other one, um, uh, the first one is about the strategy and uh, uh, mostly campaigning. And the, the second one is about uh, technical stuff. Um, it's a little more nerdy. Um, Extend time. And <laughs> it's at the sea base at eight o'clock. Yeah, we're social swarm. Thank you. Thanks. All right, coming up, Tinker Forge Bricks. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And and then just double check that this is the deck. Is this the correct deck? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Also, another thing, you don't have to add the please with the slide. You can just say slide, and that's it. Um, and then after this talk, we're going to have a break, and we will return back at 10 after 2, right after this talk. So this is the last talk before the break. Um, if you have a talk coming up, uh, give me just a quick second to head out, come back in, we'll take care of everything. And without any further ado, Tinker Forge Bix, you ready to go? All right, so just say slide, and your time starts now. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Alexander Schremmer, and I want to talk to you about Tinker Forge Bricks. The mic is too, okay. Tinker Forge Bricks, no, I didn't say slide. Oh. Sorry, that uh, was the audience. Yes. 15 more seconds it, for you. It is an open source hardware building block project and everything here is open source or open hardware license on a CERN open hardware license. And it was started by two friends of mine. Slide please. So electronics can be exhausting. For example, microcontroller programming can be very hard if you get timing problems or size problems, your code doesn't fit in there, or if you want to debug a breadboard like in the lower left, then you might hit the wrong wires or connect them and 
end up with something which, which is very tedious to debug. Or if you want to solder, you need to read complex data sheets if you, don't, if you want to make a new circuit. So in the end, uh, to, to end up with such complex projects, you need to do a lot of things and you um, need to learn a lot. But um, sometimes you only want to program, you want to make something, and that's where Tinker Forge Bricks come into play. Slide, please. So the idea is to have, um, to have bricks like in the upper middle uh, part of the picture. These bricks can be combined into a stack and then you can connect other things to these bricks. So let's have an example, slide please. Here we have a motor driver, we're connected to a motor and a power supply unit. And uh, now imagine that this motor driver is connected to a computer and this computer is running some small program like two lines of code and these two lines of code in C sharp, Python, Java, whatever, or C, would uh, actually drive this motor and control it. So you actually need a connection to the system, to the computer. Slide please. So you can also add a potent poti, rotary poti here to control the motor uh, more, more complexly and this would add maybe one line of code in your, in your piece of code. Slide please. You can also stack these bricks and then you end up with um, uh, more complex systems. And why would we want to do so? Um, slide please. We um, combine these bricks together on two sides and these could talk on a wireless connection which is a derivative of Zigbee, it's called Chibi. And uh, so you connect the left stack to the computer and turn the poti, the program is running on a computer and then it controls the second stack which is lying somewhere in the room. So this is one central idea of this whole concept. Slide please. More information is available on www.tinkerforge.org or send an email to me. I, will, I can also um, demo the stuff. I'm in the hack center at the Mon Moin table. I have a few bricks and bricklets with me. And if you want to order some, um, there is a rebate code here. Um, it gives you 5% off. And uh, I asked my friends to give, give out this code to get, um, to get more traction, maybe to get more interest, yeah. It's only valid from January 1st. Thank you for your attention. Uh, you have a minute and 37 seconds left for questions, and I think you have a question right there. Um, question, is it open hardware? Uh, again, please. Is it open hardware? Yes, it's open hardware as, as in CERN license, so you can get uh, schematics and uh, um, the layout files and stuff. Another, another question? Okay, great. One last round of applause. And now we're going to head into a 10 minute break, so we will see you back here at 10 after 2. Check, check, check. Okay, great. And we're back. We have two live demos. Yeah, do, you should just do a quick check. Uh, can you check the sound off the laptop? Okay, all right. Okay, we've got two live demos um, coming up. Uh, one from Code Hero, one from Fat Lab, and then we're going to get right back into the schedule. So, without any further ado, take it away. Let me just start the time. And then, you know, basically just a quick introduction how this works. Um, each speaker has five minutes, but at the four minute mark, um, we go to the audience and I say, extend time. If you like it, applaud real quickly, and he can get the last minute if the talk sucks, we cut them off. Um, and then when you've got five se or when you got ten seconds left, I go like this, nine, eight, seven, six, and then at five. Four, three, two, one. Your time is up. So without any further ado, Alex, Code Hero, take it away. Time starts now. Yo dog, I heard you like games and hacking. So I made you a game that teaches you how to make games so you can hack the Gibson's entire stack 
And uh, so you can make games that will teach us to hack the planet. See, uh, we've been in the news lately for this thing called Code Hero, and it is a game that teaches you how to make games so you can hack the Gibson stack and hack the planet. What do we mean by the stack? Well, not just Surface, like, oh, you're going to teach kitty programming? No, this is not Logo. This is the whole stack. And secondly, uh, what do you mean by planet hacking? Well, we don't mean just raising your fists in the air. We mean hacking the planet all the way from the bottom to the top, the way civilization works. We have to start with rabbit holes. We've got to suck the normals in. Step one, the video game. They think, oh, video games. These are safe to give to my children. The first code hack they learn is they're learning to code. They enter Gambridge University, and they're given a door by Ada Lovelace, who says, I'm the enchantress of numbers, and the language is the land you can learn are Unity script for games and JavaScript for web apps. So they start with games because they want to blow stuff up. Hello world is not that exciting. And they get into transform position hacking level, and they see, okay, this is XYZ. And the way I used to teach this, so I would say, okay, here's your X, here's your Y, here's your Z, and then we do backwards yoga, negative Y, negative Z, et cetera. But it's just not a scalable teaching method. So instead, in the level, they get a code gun, and they aim at the target, and the code they have is Y minus equals four. And when they shoot, it hits the object, and Y is the reference to the object that they hit, and bam, it evals JavaScript in real time in the game engine. Bam, the object moves down, they get the gold star. That's how Code Hero works. This is your code gun. There are fizz bosses at every challenge that you learn that teach you that, that you have to master the concept. Fizz bosses, the numbers one to 100, turn into 100 evil robots you gotta beat. And the challenge is a briefing you get, and what you are told is your mission may seem impossible, but impossible is what coders do. And that's what you're learning how to do. You go through the door, you fight the robots, you get victory, you earn entry to the Hall of Heroes, you're there as a peer, not as a fanboy. And ultimately, your real test is to ship something, and the final boss is ship boss, because real artists ship. And you actually, there's a real pirate ship in the game where you have to ship your game, and you're taught how to do that. And the whole point is that this is the reverse rabbit hole. First, they brought them into the world of code, so we could bring them out of the world of code so they become a maker and actually feel they've made something. That's planet hack number one, make everybody a maker with Unity so they can create their own games. And we're creating a platform called Primer where those games that people make will be able to teach all the things that need teaching. And that's what I'm asking you people in the audience with all of your skills and brilliance to do afterwards. So to do this, we then go to another rabbit hole. We say, well, you know, that's all well and good, but what about the web? So first, then we teach them web hacking. So they learn to make these web apps, and there's in-game web browsers. It's not a browser game. It has a browser in it. But that's not enough, because there's something behind the browser. Where does the code run? Uh, Alec, I could just stop real one quick second. Your sound's kind of clipping out. Uh, can you just step back, just yeah. do a quick sound check? So where does the code run? Well, it runs on servers. And then they find out the rabbit hole is revealed. All that code is running on virtual machines, which we use VNC and SSH sessions to pipe the player into. So when they play this game, they break into backtrack and a virtual topology of networks that they're learning to hack the whole Linux all the way down. And their first mission is, you know, break into a login system, go through a door. You guys have all seen Armitage. I don't need to show you this video for most of you, but if you want to watch it, it's basically Mudge said, hey, kids, you like hacking? You want to fight China? Here, play this video game. Uh, and it's basically like hacking the Gibson in the movies, but it's a real Metasploit visual front end that does uh, red team collaborative hacking. So we give them tools like this to give them an intro into the world of code and how it actually works. So the point of Gamebridge is if you look up in the sky, there's all the stars. They're actually the cities of the Earth. And we're telling them, don't just play the game, go to hacker spaces. So planet hack number two, meet at University, which is our word for the universal college that is every hacker space. We invite them to come to the space, and this is what the classes look like, and teach each other. And what they do is we get these like six and seven year old girls with their cute little skull mittens learning video game programming and teaching adults, because they've been learning it. And they go back to regular school and they look sad. And they say, teacher, why can't this be a hacker space? So suddenly, we're going to hack into their entire school system by One hacking minute, the future. extend time. So we create. <laughs> We create makerhoods. We have a makerhood that's not just hacker spaces, it's hacker quarters where you live and hack academies where your kids and you go to school. The hacker space becomes a place to live, a place to go to school. Hack the Future is an example of the school. We have Al Alcorn invented video games teaching next to a 12 year old who made 40 video games already. And this is growing. Our power level is reaching over 9,000, actually about 900. Uh, but we are being excellent to each other and our goals are simple. Teach each other to hack the Gibson by learning game code, learning web code, learning Linux, so that we can hack the planet, ship something, meet up at university, and make an entire makerhood. We have billboards all over the cities where these are being told to people, hack yourself, hack the planet, hack the future. And what we're leading towards is a world where Code Hero is just a gateway drug into makerhoods. So if you want to learn more about Code Hero, we have a Kickstarter we just launched, 
and it is primerlabs.com, makerhoods.com. Thank you very much. Hack the planet. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Um, there, there will be a live demo at Berlin Sides if you want to see it again. Uh, one more round of applause for Alex. That was a really awesome demo. Okay. And do we have Fat Labs? Okay, you're good? All right. Live demo number two. Okay, and also just so that you guys know, live demos, if you decide to do one, your setup time, your, your setup time is taken off of your time to encourage people to send in their slides in advance. So we are going to start the clock right now. Great. Okay. So. Oh, uh, mic, mic check, real quick. Okay. Oops, it's kind of tall. Hi, I'm Geraldine, and I'm from Fat Lab. I'm one of the twenty, almost twenty-two fellows that we are already. We are celebrating uh, this year our fifth anniversary already. So probably next year we're going to do some trouble about it. So I'm going to show you the last projects we have done. And um, this is the Googler, which was made by Andy. And basically, it's like a, a dildo that pings when you uh, ping, when your browsers ping Google. So here it is. Oh, yeah, I don't know what is. Oh. Oh. So yeah, this is very useful. Oh. Um, oh. <laughs> then we have the project of our speed fellow Aram. Uh, he made this. Um, he made art with uh, that like sketchy art to art to do to spyware that you Germans do to spy people in the world. Nigga still got love for you. Uh, you can go to Café Morgan and see this like uh, code that was uh, printing in fast, I think, with uh, the whole uh, reverse engineer code for the uh, R2D2 awesome. thing. We're done. So it's that easy to turn code into art, and now it's your turn to make your own artwork. And it's especially worthy doing this when you find, I don't know, very beautiful code, or maybe you find code which is very fucked up. Like this code... <laughs> And then we have the QR code generator that Golan uh, Levin, that it's our latest new fellow, latest new fellow, did. So you can just uh, generate some stencils for graffiti in the street. Your QR codes. He made these Kobo codes uh, based on that application that you can download, obviously from Fat. And then we make this project for Occupy. Uh, we recruit a GIF army. We ask people to send us their protest gifts. Then we create um, a little code that you can add into your web page to protest from your browser, not even your couch. And we really took uh, to the next level the, I don't know, couch activism uh, concept. Then we make this service. Once we have uh, all these gifts that we recruit and people started like adding to their sites, which were, which were like more than 700, we gave them this service so you can force occupy any website on the internet that you want. So you can put like on Bloomberg, on Goldman Sachs, or whatever your protest, your gift protest. And then we make this uh, plugin that you can just occupy with a 99% and see how many people were protest and you could be in protest mode or in peaceful mode. <laughs> and these are most lots of the screenshots we got from the people that actually put the protest in their website, which as I said were more than 700. 
Then um, it was our first Occupy plugin was also in the TEPCO research. One minute, extend time. Okay, we did all of that. And, oh, sorry. We made an exhibition and also we have a new uh, documentary that was on PBS, but we don't have time to see it. So you will have to see it in your house. And yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Okay, you, you've got 30, 31 seconds, but yeah, I, I guess. Know. Where are you? In Berlin? No, we are in the internet. <laughs> <laughs> can you use your, uh, your protest widget uh, for other things too? Yeah, you can use it. For instance, I didn't show it, but we did an exhibition. So we use all the people that put their, we use all the website that put this code to show them an exhibition we curate with some hack, uh, Evan curate with some hackers and like some artists and, and other people that make uh, net art. So yeah, you can use it, uh, it, the code is in GitHub. So if you want to use it for force occupy other things, <laughs> other sites. Cool. Another thing you can do with your uh, lightning talk is show a video and um, per, our sound, our audio angel, a big round of applause for these angels that are helping me do this thing right now because I could not do it without them. And so he's got a video that he's going to be playing with his, as a part of his lightning talk, which is another thing you can do. We have plenty of open room, um, especially tomorrow uh, for the Pecha Kucha round. And there are still some slots open on day four. So get your entries in. Uh, the email address is 28C3 at nickfar, N-I-C-K-F-A-R-R dot org. Um, and you can find all, can I talk and do this at the same time? Um, and you can find all information on how to apply for a lightning talk on the wiki under the article lightning talks. So without any further ado, um, and now you're going to do the talk first, then video? Talk video talk. Huh? We'll tell you when to play. Okay. And you've got the timing right because you've got five minutes. Okay. okay. Mike, Mike so Go. first, a uh, quick introduction. In Belgium, we have the SNCB, the railway company. And uh, this year, they strike already 22 times. Um, so travelers, of course, aren't happy. Um, so that's why we decided to react. And since I'm a hacker, I reacted on the hacker way. Yeah, there's no audio, but it's subtitled. We didn't figure out you have to push the bit, uh, big red button. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now it goes like ding, ding. So, like, uh, thanks. So, we have 50,000 views, and this is just Flanders, so it's a really small area of the world. Uh, and the subtitles in English are only on there since yesterday. Um, so, like, one minute later, um, there was another broadcast from the conductor saying, yeah, please ignore the previous message. Uh, it was not from the NMBS. We are tracking the guy down right now. Uh, they didn't find me. So 
why could we do this? Because uh, the railway company, for all their locks, or almost all their locks, they use this generic square key that you can just get off eBay for $2. Um, so uh, the strike was on Thursday, and we uh, posted the video on Friday. Um, and Sunday, I got a call from uh, Newsblad. It's one of the major uh, newspapers in uh, Flanders. And uh, the next day, so that was Christmas Day, and they sent a photographer, and the next day we had a, almost a full-page interview in one of the biggest newspapers, or not one of the biggest, but one of the major. Um, and then uh, was some small local TV station played it in the news, and uh, the radio tried to get an interview, but I was on my way here, so... Um, so this is what you get if you use lame keys for security. And the railway company, they stated that they are still um, investigating or uh, doubting if they will file a complaint, but um, yeah. Um, the Debian booth uh, uh, offers you a free beer. At least it's stated by someone. <laughs> All right, um, thanks. So I hope you enjoyed it and thank you. And just so that you know, all um, links will be available online on the wiki article, um, Lightning Talks, as well as information on how to apply for talks. But since we're running a little bit slow on time, uh, we've got Willow and Jimmy who are going to be talking about the Queer Geeks panel. So without any further ado, go. Hello. Um, so my name is Jimmy Rogers, and this is Willow Blue. Uh, Mitch Altman couldn't be here because he's currently running a uh, Arduino workshop in the hardware hacking area that's completely packed. So it's actually kind of nice to have a break. But tonight we are having in room A04. It's downstairs in the basement, just to the right. Uh, Queer Geeks panel. So that's for everyone who's gay, bi, um, transgendered, whatever, or just interested in. Um, queer issues and specifically talking about them in the hacker community and the hacker scene, um, how that relates to pretty much everybody there. It's a very welcoming environment and we'll be talking about um, our experiences with these things. Um, yeah, so. You don't have to be gay or queer to show up. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you, you can just really like Rainbow Dash. Or not, that's cool too. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so it's in uh, room A04 in the basement uh, tonight at, um, oh, it's not on here, but it's at nine o'clock. And then afterwards there is a um, meetup for queer geeks and naughty nerds, which is a local Berlin thing um, at, uh, <sighs> sorry. Why did you make it so complicated? I know, I know. <laughs> Sorry, I can't uh, do this. Speak into the microphone, please. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to unlock my, uh, my phone and my passcode. I've entered it incorrectly five times. So anyways, um, yeah, it's at uh, Future... Um, silver. Yes, uh, Future Silver, something like that. Yeah, I, I can tell you in about 30 seconds. Anyways, yeah. You can find it on the internet. I, I trust your, your foo. <laughs> yep. Um, so that should be about it. Um, any questions, I guess? No. Okay. And um, yeah, and Nick Farr head rubs are still only 20 cents. So. <laughs> okay, you're done. You're done. Yeah, I'm <laughs> done. Of I'm done. Okay. All right, thank you, Jimmy. And ignore that last message. <laughs> All right, o Odin. And we're running a little bit behind, so we're just going to get it started right away. You ready? Oh. oh, crap. Would you mind pushing to day four? Oh, shoot. Um, I thought you were kidding. <laughs> okay, um, then why don't we go to... Uh
So I asked him before to open it with Adobe Reader because I have the malicious JavaScript code inside. <laughs> um, is, the grep, is the grep for Python talk here? Grep for there is much to find in Python. And securing the server's privacy policy for, for, for providers. Are you still here? Okay, you're, right, you're ready to go? Okay, well then. Um, I really don't want to install Adobe Reader. I really don't want to do this. I'm going to. Is it, is it here at the BCC? Okay, yeah, fetch, fetch your computer. We'll, we'll do that. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That was my, yeah. I really, really would rather not install Adobe Reader. Um, but in the meantime, uh, so the grep Python talk is not in attendance. Okay. Um, is there anybody here that has a quick lightning talk that they would just want to do right now while the computer is being fetched? Anybody? Nothing on their computer. Um, well, just to kill time, if you'll permit me. Um, I have a presentation that I actually gave at the Meta Lab, so it's not a pro not totally appropriate for here, but it's a but it is for an ongoing project of mine, which I would not normally do. Uh, just let me find it. I'm going to breeze through this, and maybe I should have the other um, Herald Angel time me, just to make sure. I, I usually breeze through this, and this was originally given at the Meta Lab, a hackerspace in Austria, but I figure while we're waiting, just to kill time, keep the things going. Oh, you already started me? Yep. Okay, all right, well, I guess. And it's, it's a silent lightning talk, so.
So yes, it is also possible to do silent lightning talks if you'd like. And now we're going to get the video set up and I think we're perhaps even back on time because right after this presentation, uh, yep, right after this presentation, we will have um, We have securing the servers, privacy policy providers, and I believe they're going to be using the rest of the time in the room to do a workshop afterwards. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. So without any further ado, ready? Go. So, hi. Um, maybe you know, no, no, my computer fucked up. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's why you should submit your PDF slides to Nick <laughs> before what? I don't know what's now. I knew we were going to have a screw up in a live demo today. Yeah, I knew it as well, therefore. <laughs> I don't know, something. You know, I'm, I'm actually halfway tempted to, to give you some time because of the screw up with the last minute, me not having what you asked me for. Should I, is that, is that okay? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure in future years, people are going to use that as a strategy. How can I make a complicated enough request that's not too complicated to get Nick to screw up so that if I screw up, I have time to fix it? I probably shouldn't have said that, should I? <laughs> if somebody wants to do a lightning talk about fixing screw-ups fast, I think that would be amazing. <laughs> See, I actually get my best jokes from the audience in the front row. All about misdirection. Hmm? It's all about misdirection. Yes, it is all about misdirection. And this is about restarting LightDM fast. I don't know if you can see them, but there's some really cute photos here in the lower left-hand corner of his desktop. Yeah, whatever. I, I do it in this way. Okay. So, um, I saw now, um, you know, maybe LaTeX Beamer, so uh, a really cool tool to make presentations. And, and usually you have this slide on the presentation. And um, the problem of LaTeX Beamer is that Adobe has no good presentation mode. So you see it from PowerPoint and all this stuff. And yeah, this is my attempt to create a good presentation mode for it. So. Um, you configure your computer to um, this resolution, you configure the project to have this resolution, and you do it like this, that you put it on a specific position, then you see only this thing on the presentation and all the other only on my laptop. That's what I tried when my computer fucked up. Yeah, <laughs> great. Uh, and the thing is, then you can use the rest of the page to show the next slide to show your presentation mode and even to show what you see in the bottom corner to count your time. And this is done in JavaScript. So you see it here, down here. It counts my time, it counts um, the total time, it counts from this page, it gets read because I'm a little too slow. And um, you have other cool stuff like click per minute ratios and slide per minute ratios. And uh, you have uh, some 
a field here in the top over there where you have all the pages where you can jump directly because the problem is that the uh, Adobe pages which are in the PDF are not the pages you see here and if afterwards somebody asks oh, can you please go to slide three back then you can just click here and go to slide three which is not necessarily the, the um, Adobe page three. And um, one um, great addition you have in this thing too is that after you have done your talk and tried to, to do your talk, you can just go to the first page, um, unclick the count time and then you can review how long you uh, took, uh, how long it took you to take this slide. So for example on this slide I took, uh, I, uh, I am, um, waited 33 three seconds. Um, this everything can be exported of course, so you have a summary here which just opens the JavaScript console then and then you have here this is in text to have it for all slides and what you can do is you can go to your LaTeX code and write the frame time in t into your frame so just beneath begin frame you make frame time and then you put the seconds in and then you have for all the slides the time you have for this slide only and it counts down the slide um, only this slide the timer and it gets only for uh, you have a really fine grained modification which is even cooler than in the PowerPoint thing. So, um, I think this is not the end because I have uh, ideas how this can be improved further. So, because when you have this presentation, so this is one PDF and you come to another computer, I mean, you have to configure the other computer in this way, which is really hard and it only works on Linux uh, this great. Um, what I have in mind is to have something where you have only this one as a PDF and um, you need some uh, some program which controls the other window, so controlling the um, Adobe window and controlling another Evans window or another Adobe window which shows the next slide which you can have on your computer. So and therefore I want to write this um, in this way. So if you want to help me, contact me, you can just um, yeah, Google for me, you will find it, real hackers will find it. Um, uh, yeah, this one and yeah, that's it. And, and just one more round of applause for him being really good in recovering because of our mutual mess up. <laughs> okay, securing the servers, you're up. Um, do you want to use your laptop for the presentation or should you go through the slides that you sent me and then do your workshop? Oh yeah, yeah, that's probably best. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. On the podium. Yeah. So, uh -huh. So how many people here are thinking about submitting a lightning talk for day three or day four? We've got one, two, three, okay. You know I'm gonna be pushing this really hard for the next two days, right? Um, coming up tomorrow in tomorrow's lightning talks, we have a lightning talk about dead drops. Um, ooh, an interesting X509 talk. Uh, we have something from the hacker fleet, and there's probably lots more in my email that I will get to shortly. So, ready to go? Okay, and then you have a roughly 15 minutes for your workshop afterwards. If you can, if you're absolutely desperate for finding workshop time, usually at the end of the lightning talks, we use the little tiny break there um, to give people a chance to do workshops, and we will be doing that tomorrow and the day after. The Rocket Badge people are probably going to be doing a workshop after lightning talks in here 
tomorrow and um, the last day we have uh, Mitch doing a workshop on mental health issues. So without any further ado, you guys ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Last one. Uh, do we have an additional microphone? This doesn't work. Oh, it works. Okay, cool. Uh, no, no, we we can. Do we? Do you have? You sure? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Don't don't forget to. It's it's bad to talk too far away from the microphone, and then sometimes it's even worse when you talk way too close to the microphone. So find an appropriate distance. Uh, we'll we'll signal you and take it away. So hello, chaos. Um, we are a group of system administrators that started to talk about how to uh, care about our users and about uh, the safety of our, our users. And we put together a kind of checklist uh, for everybody to um, understand how to um, run servers and uh, care about uh, the users. And um, it is for uh, system administrators, for uh, users, and uh, also for everybody. But we will explain in detail. Yeah. So this is not sorry. This is not just about running service. It's uh, <coughs> primarily about running service with a focus on privacy and secure setups and things like this. Um, so the problem we've uh, started with basically is that we've realized that many users cannot or should not trust their hosting or communication providers like ISPs and uh, not ISPs only, but mostly hosting, yeah, hosting and communication providers like, uh, yeah, you know what this is. So many providers, especially commercial ones, make claims on uh, privacy and security which they cannot keep, uh, which you often find out by in terms of data leaks or whatever. And um, often anonymous access to services is not available in, on these terms. So we need to, we want to find a better way to manage this. And why do we want to um, do that? Because uh, we want to raise awareness of privacy issues uh, and we want to make uh, users able to choose their providers based on uh, some more uh, concrete information and uh, information that they understand. And also we want to increase the solidarity between uh, groups and uh, people who uh, maintain, but also people who use services, because we think that uh, solidarity is important when it comes to um, repression, to leaks, uh, when it comes to defending ourselves and uh, our community. Um, we also think that uh, to have such a checklist um, is good for compatibility, for uh, connecting different projects, uh, and to ensuring uh, secure communication between uh, projects, for example, for mails. Um, also, we think that to have a ch such a checklist, as with all checklists, it's uh, providing more um, security just because people can be aware and uh, after they think that uh, they, ha they, they have done everything, they can check if uh, something is missing from their setup. So how do we get there? Um, well, we started by um, defining a set of standards that are easily understood uh, by both SWIT admins and users. And um, yeah, we provided some, or we want to provide some examples for best practice, like how do you set up, how do you set my, I set up my service so that they are privacy enhanced, secure, and things like this. And um, yeah, we want to provide a modular system, which um, can be adapted to the needs of different organizations, not just hosting providers, but also other. Uh, providers of internet services. Um, products can announce and advertise their tariffs to the policy. So everybody who takes part in it can say, hey, we're doing this and we have like this in, um, privacy enhanced policy and they can use it as kind of advertisement or to actually increase the trust to their users. So we call it provider's commitment for privacy and uh, you can see on all slides the website address uh, and you can read the whole document there. And uh, please, One minute, uh, extend time. So please uh, contribute uh, to the best practices document. Please make suggestions for the next version. 
and uh, please contact us uh, on the address that you find on the website. And uh, basically, this was what we wanted to give us a lightning talk. Um, I can give you more uh, information uh, soon, um, because now we have, uh, I guess, we have uh, around 30 minutes, right? We have around 30 minutes uh, in the room? Close, closer, to, closer to 15 for, for a break. Okay, yeah. so we have around 15 minutes. Um, well, actually, we've got five. Come on, come on. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of your presentation, and now you've got 15 minutes for your workshop. But the lightning talks are now over, and um, they're going to have the, because of the last talk, they get the opportunity to do a workshop. Thank you so much for coming. We've got Pecha Kucha coming up on day two, and um, the final round of lightning talks tomorrow. So thank you again. A huge round of applause for all the lightning talks and for the upcoming workshop. Thank you. Thank you.